Hello students, this week we're gonna be um, talking about chapter 14, social interventions, um, prevention through environmental change. And so a lot of what we've been talking about is individual change. So specifically targeted at helping the individual. This is gonna look at like kind of broader concepts and looking at the environments and situations and experiences and stuff from outside of the person, not just from inside. So prevention and human services, what is it? Um, we can use a couple of different things. We can use usually the cognitive behavioral approach, which I know we talked about a little bit before, and you're gonna have this in much greater detail in other courses. Um, but definitely looking from a prevention standpoint would be best. And so how can we prevent individuals from having difficulties and looking at the systems and things like that that are causing those issues in individuals and changing them to prevent the person from having the impact. And so there's um, three different levels of prevention that have been identified. The primary prevention, and a good example of that is Project Head Start. And so looking at children that could be identified as having difficulties in school later on and having a program for them before school even begins so that you get them off to a great start. Um, this Then it's secondary preventions and then tertiary preventions, which would be like re rehabilitation. So getting the person kind of like back into the groove of um, doing things maybe the way that they used to or um, in ways that are more ideal for them, maybe a better fit. Um, limited social intervention. And so we're looking at changing institutions versus changing people. So again, kind of looking at the bigger systems at play versus individual people. And so the, the textbook kind of goes over a couple examples of environmental change that could be possible. But again, this is not exhaustive. There's um, tons of different types of um, interventions or things we can um, intervene with. Um, the text also brings up the question of does limited social intervention really work? And so it gives you a number of studies that are cited in there um, that have looked at this question and for the most part been able to identify the ways in which um, limited social intervention can be helpful for a um, number of different people in a number of different situations. And then it goes on to give you some examples of limited social intervention, which is included, which includes um, the community lodge program that it talks about in detail what what um, happens there and, and what the impact was. Also, um, this is really focused on changing personal environment. So um, how can um, can we look at um, not necessarily just the big systems and institutions, but look at the environments um, that are sort of directly around people. And so looking at having perseverance, um, change, um, being independent of what resources are available, um, having outside interventions um, versus, you know, just internally expecting change from within, um, and then recognizing that change requires action. And so it's action oriented. It's something we should be doing, not just talking about or thinking about or planning for, but actually getting out there and doing it. And how can we encourage um, the individuals that we're working with to also take some action? Um, it's important to remember that we can and should start small. It does not have to be this huge thing, but we can start with very little steps and um, take them as far as we possibly can and, and not think of this as something that's, that has to be very overwhelming, but can grow. Um, and so they talk about using a grassroots approach. And so what we know about grassroots approach is that um, it does start very small. It does start with individuals coming together and doing what they can and then building on that which helps us to obtain wide involvement. And so getting more and more um, people invested and involved in taking actions. And we take those actions as part of a group. And so instead of a bunch of individuals doing the work on their own, kind of maybe doubling each other's efforts and spending a lot of energy that doesn't need to be repeating each other's efforts, but we come together and we're together as a team, which um, allows us to have continuous effort because there's less like Lehood for burnout with each individual person because we're kind of relying on each other to help um, steer things along. Um, so moving from limited social intervention to comprehensive social intervention. So your textbook talks a little bit about some early um, comprehensive social interventions, including um, 
prohibition and social security taking um, some bigger structures into account and um, working on them to help individual people. And then talks about some, tra some trends in comprehensive social interventions. So what have we seen since then? And this includes civil rights legisla legislation and what we've seen over the years with the civil rights movement, the women's movement and the LGBTQ um, IA movement and so on. Oh, and then Medicare, Medicaid and managed care is um, a lot of what we're continuing to deal with as well as far as um, insurance coverage for the services that we provide. Um, and then it goes on to talk about some examples of comprehensive social interventions, such as poverty and welfare reform and what has been done um, to deal with those um, social issues and, and what you know, we're, we can continue to do um, to work on those issues. Um, next, the text looks at sociocultural interventions in human services. So these are different um, methods of intervening with systems. And so one is indigenous workers. And so taking people from the communities that we're trying to help and empowering them to continue to help the community. Peer therapy, so using um, people who are struggling with some of the same issues to help each other, especially those who maybe have done some change work, um, can help those who are just beginning. Um, para helpers, so people who um, assist in making those changes happen um, and helping the um, individuals we work with on a more one-to-one, day-to-day -one, -day kind of basis. And then mutual self-help groups. And so how can people come together in groups um, related to a very specific common issue that maybe all of them are facing um, and, and help to identify self-help strategies that they can support one another in. What makes mutual self-help systems successful? Um, and so obviously not everybody engaging in them is gonna be on the same playing field, but what is really helpful is if there's a lot of honesty, responsibility and involvement. Um, otherwise they may struggle and individuals may feel like they're not getting as much help as they, they might need or desire. And then mutual self-help groups and the human service worker. And so how can, you know, we talked about before um, in previous chapters, the more, I think it was in crisis intervention, the more um, different systems that are involved with an individual, the more help they're going to be getting, and therefore the better their outcomes could be. Human services and social advocacy. And so, you know, obviously there's advocacy for individuals, right? Like we can advocate for our client and encourage them to advocate for themselves. And we can advocate for ourselves within our profession, but we could also um, advocate for our field as a whole. We can advocate for clients as a whole, specific social um, issues or psychological issues as a whole. And we can really use our advocacy efforts to make those changes in the systems that are impacting us and our clients as individuals. And so mobilization of the disadvantaged, so helping individuals within the communities become advocates for themselves and also help them to advocate. Um, social structuralist viewpoint is discussed and what that looks like and how that plays a role. Um, behavior is a product of a biopsychological development and how this um, does not always play out and that the, um, the environments that we're in have a big impact on our behavior. And so changing the environments again in the systems and stuff will have a big impact on individuals' behavior. And then social advocacy groups and how we might get um, a lot out of being part of different social advocacy groups, um, again, that advocate for things that are important to us, important for our clients, or just really important in general. So in summary, this um, chapter talked about problems that are complicated by societal factors and that not when we work with individual clients, we're not going to be able to address everything within them, that there's a lot around them happening that needs to be addressed as well. Mm -hmm. Talked about the differences between limited social interaction and comprehensive social interaction and how those things make a big difference in impacting the lives of clients. Talked about different types of peer therapy, mutual um, help, and, and self-help groups, and um, not only what those look like, but how those can be helpful um, in, in different communities and in the work that we do um, as well. And so with all of the chapters, make sure you take a look at the questions before the chapter begins. Um, when you go into your reading, take a look at the case examples. They're so helpful in understanding this material. And then finally, at the end of the chapter, take a look at all of the resources um, and additional activities that you can engage in that may be helpful in you incorporating this information a little bit further and 
um, and understanding it a little bit better. And so you will see me again one final time for, um, well, I guess maybe not one final time. We'll probably do one more video for chapter 15 and then I'll, I'll post an end of the semester video. So maybe twice, but one more chapter. Um, we're almost there. We see the finish line. We're getting close to the, to the end of the semester. So hopefully you all are just as excited as I am. And, um, you know, hopefully you learned a lot so far this semester. Bye.